Thank you, Mihir, for those nice remarks. I'm here to talk about a, a subject that's uh, dear to my heart as well, UN peace operations. Um, the UN peacekeeping brand Aha. Let's try that again. There we go. The UN peacekeeping brand is in crisis. It's not the first time, and it's not the worst. The darkest days for the UN were in 1994 and 1995, when peacekeepers stood by and watched civilians massacred in Rwanda and Srebrenica. But things today are bad. Host governments are asking peacekeepers to leave. Local populations are throwing rocks at UN vehicles. Violent extremists are bombing UN compounds. Things are bad enough that some scholars are suggesting that the entire enterprise is on the brink of disaster, a noble experiment doomed to go down in history as a failure. I'm not among the doomsayers. I spent a good part of my working life at the UN working on peacekeeping. I've been studying and teaching about peacekeeping. I'm a fan of the enterprise. After all, there have been some, some successes in El Salvador and Mozambique and Namibia, Early 1990s, Sierra Leone, Timor-Leste, more recently. But the trends are worrying, and they're likely to get worse. To understand why, it's important to understand how far peacekeeping has come since 1956. That was the year when 6,000 lightly armed troops were sent to the Sinai Peninsula in the aftermath of the Suez Canal crisis. Wearing hand-painted blue helmets, this was the first armed peacekeeping mission, so the helmets literally had to be painted by hand, they had an important but fairly straightforward task. They observed the withdrawal of French, British, and Israeli forces from the Sinai, and they stood on the border between Israel and Egypt to monitor the ceasefire. Times have changed. Peace operations have become more ambitious, they've become more robust, and they become more dangerous. These are not your grandfather's peacekeeping missions. Not only are they, are they there to monitor ceasefires, but they're also there to help transform a society, to get at the root causes, typically, of an internal conflict. Now, what does that entail? Well, it entails disarming ex-combatants. It means helping refugees and internally displaced persons to return home. It means monitoring human rights and conducting elections. And it means helping to rebuild security, justice, and political institutions. And sometimes it means using, or using force to protect civilians. Hopefully, ideally, the mere presence of armed police is enough to deter violence. Sometimes more robust military action needs to be taken. Now, all of this would be hard enough in places where the UN is welcomed with open arms. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. In 2003, in Baghdad, a suicide bomber drove a truck into the UN headquarters. The head of the mission, Sergio Vieira de Mello, one of the UN's great troubleshooters, was killed that day along with 21 colleagues. Two of them were personal friends. I remember gathering at the memorial service in New York asking ourselves, what happened? The UN flag used to be a symbol of peace. Now it's become a target of violence. And today, peace operations are facing asymmetric threats in Mali, Somalia, and who knows what will happen if they go back to Libya, or are sent to Yemen, or sent to Syria. Research tells us that there's a connection between the effectiveness of a peace operation and its legitimacy. Legitimacy is a subjective concept. It's about perceptions and beliefs, not objective standards. And the perceptions and beliefs that matter most are of those most affected by the action or decision being taken. So how a peace operation is perceived by the local authorities, by the local population, is critically important to its success. And that's what's worrying about the crisis today. It's not simply a matter of poor execution. It's a crisis of legitimacy. 
Why is that? Well, to begin with, the Security Council is dysfunctional. The UN Security Council is dysfunctional. On some of the big issues of the day, like Syria and Ukraine, it's virtually paralyzed. Okay? But even when it does act, it has a habit of adopting these famous Christmas tree mandates, a wish list of desirable goals with little sense whatsoever of what the circumstances on the ground actually require. Okay. Second, the promise to physically protect civilians generates expectations that often can't be met. The UN should be applauded for some recent bold moves it's taken, for example, to send an intervention brigade with attack helicopters to the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, or by allowing hundreds of thousands of civilians into UN compounds in South Sudan when the violence there escalated in 2013. But these are Band-Aids. They're not durable solutions. And most troubling of all, the peacekeepers themselves have become a threat to the civilian. Many have been accused of sexual exploitation and abuse. Despite all the efforts that were made since the early 2000s, allegations continue to surface most recently in the Central African Republic. So what's to be done? Well, obviously, there are no easy solutions. But there are a few politically realistic steps that could be taken. First, the UN needs to engage in more inclusive consultations before setting a mandate for a peace operation. This can be done by sending an advanced mission whose purpose is to consult widely with all of the local actors, not only those who fought the war, but community leaders, representatives of civil society. This can help mitigate the problem of an imposed peace decided in New York or an elite peace decided only by those who fought the war. Second, if, military, if robust military action needs to be taken to protect civilians, follow it up with robust political action. This is what happened in Sierra Leone. Fode Senko, the rebel leader famous for cutting hands off of children, was captured opening space for a political process there. But that could only work if a protection of civilian strategy is harnessed to a broader political strategy. And third, stamp out sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers once and for all. The UN recently took a step in the right direction by naming and shaming troop contributing countries that didn't respond to the allegations against their peacekeepers. Those countries can take another step. They can hold court martials in the places where the abuses occur. For a peace operation to preserve its legitimacy in the eyes of a local population, justice not only needs to be done, it must be seen to be done. Thank you.